Welcome to this brief video on the spleen as viewed in Western medical history. I use the word West broadly here to contrast this description to the ideas proposed in Chinese traditional medicine, which I have covered in a different video, and with Ayurvedic medicine. When one considers the size and location of the spleen in the body, it's remarkable that this relatively small and well-hidden organ has provoked so much anatomic interest and gained so much importance since antiquity in so many cultures. This may be explained by an early presupposition of symmetry in the body. The spleen is somewhat similar to the liver in form. Early observations may have been influenced by pathological cases of splenomegaly, which would have made up for the usual difference in size. The first known Greek medical writer, Alcmaion of Croton, who lived around 500 BCE, postulated that the opposing powers of wetness, dryness, hotness, cold, sweetness and bitterness were key to health and if any of them dominated, this would lead to disease. His work was followed by the Hippocratic Corpus, which dates to around 400 BCE. Although these texts carry the name of Hippocrates of Kos, they're now considered to be the work of diverse physicians who extended early ideas and documented various diseases. They started to make connections between the qualities of heat, cold, wetness and dryness with the bodily fluids. The bodily fluids were then thought to be blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. It's possible that this division was inspired by blood which has settled and divided into plasma, white blood cells, and red blood cells. They were further linked to the four basic elements of matter that had been proposed by Empedocles. These elements or roots were earth, fire, air, and water. Blood was the clear red fluid flowing in our arteries. It was associated with air. Yellow bile was seen as rising. It was associated with fire and linked to the liver and gallbladder. Black bile was seen as sinking. It was associated with the earth and linked with the lungs and the spleen. Phlegm was associated with water and linked with the urinary system. It was the Greek physician Galen of Pergamon who consolidated and expanded these theories. His ideas were to dominate Western medical thought for the next 1300 years. Galen was a prolific writer. For a time he was surgeon to Roman gladiators, so he had ample opportunity to observe human anatomy. However, he based his findings on the basis of dissections of animals such as monkeys that he believed had a physiology similar to that of humans. Dissection of humans was deemed unacceptable at that time. He recorded that the intestines produced chyle, which is a real observable fluid consisting of lymph and emulsified fats. This was transported to the liver via the portal vein. From there onwards, he reverted to many of the original incorrect Hippocratic ideas to explain the physiology of the body. He states that the liver produces blood. The residual products are yellow bile that passes into the stomach, black bile that is transported to the spleen before being moved to the stomach, and water which is sent to the kidneys and then to the bladder. Thus the spleen was postulated to have a role in the digestive process. This explanation remained unquestioned for the next several hundred years. After the fall of Rome, Greek medical knowledge was preserved and extended by Persian and Arabic physicians, such as Avicenna and Averroes, but always in line with Galen's fundamental ideas. It was the Flemish anatomist and physician Andreas Vesalius who was to start the reversal of Galen's influence. Vesalius was professor at the University of Padua, and then became physician at the court of Emperor Charles V. He was later to be recognized as the founder of modern human anatomy, he conducted a public dissection of an executed criminal in Basel in 1543. On the basis of this and other dissections, he pointed out errors in Galen's observations and conclusions and published them with highly detailed illustrations in his seven-volume book, De Humani Corporis Fabrica. Among his observations was the lack of conduit between the stomach and the spleen that Galen had postulated. He also showed differences in the vasculature between the liver and the spleen, refuting the notion of symmetry in the body. Ironically, however, he did not refute Galen's physiological notions, but modified them slightly. 
1628, William Harvey introduced the physiological model that we recognize to this day. Although a number of physicians, such as Colombo, Servetus, Dubois and Cesalpino had laid the ground before him, their argumentation had been limited. Harvey used an experimental, quantitative and mechanistic methodology to clearly show that the heart was not a mystical spiritual centre, but rather a pump that sent blood out through the arteries in a circuit, which returned to the heart through the veins. Harvey described the course of the splenic vein, and proposed that the function of the spleen was to act as some sort of filter for the blood. Although Harvey's work overturned Gallant's physiological theories, he wrote about body juices, and did not fully exorcise the notion of the Hippocratic fluids. The role of the non-blood fluids, especially black bile which had been associated with the spleen, was now greatly diminished, although they still remained in medical literature for some years. In 1651, Nathaniel Highmore showed that there was no passage of blood from the liver to the spleen, or from the spleen to the stomach. He described the external tunic and the trabeculae, or internal supporting structures, of the spleen. The Italian physician Marcello Malpighi was the first to use the microscope to investigate the body's organs and tissues. He was the first to describe glands as cell clusters emptying their contents into a central canal for distribution to the rest of the body. He classified the spleen as a gland and observed the activities of sacs within the organ that appeared to send out blood that activated bile production in the liver. The Dutch anatomist Frederick Reich recognized the existence of valves in the lymphatic system. On the basis of injection experiments, in 1696 he determined that the spleen was a vascular or blood gland. William Hewson, known as the father of hematology, noted that the spleen separated lymphocytes from blood and that it played a role in the hematopoietic system, which creates blood. Rudolf Albert von Kerlika described the spleen as a blood vascular gland, which is in some way concerned with the renewal of blood, and probably with the secretion of bile also. Much progress in understanding the spleen in the 18th and 19th century came from the field of surgery. There are many reports of successful spleen removal or splenectomy in the 19th century, performed to treat either enlarged spleens or punctured spleens. It had long been observed that spleen removal in humans and in mammals appeared to have very little adverse effect on the patient, prompting the question as to whether the spleen was a vital organ for life. Gallen himself had reported this claim, but preferred to ignore this in his conjectures. Another, even more curious suggestion comes from ancient times. According to Pliny, both men and horses would run faster if their spleen was removed. An experiment run at Johns Hopkins in 1922 showed that this was valid in the case of rats. By the end of the 19th century, although there were still areas of mystery surrounding this organ, it was now much clearer that the spleen was mainly involved in blood filtration and with the body's lymphatic system, and that it had very little relationship with the digestive tract near which it was physically located. In the 20th century, the invention of non-intrusive imaging technologies and new improved chemical techniques finally gave us our current extensive knowledge of the anatomy and physiology of the spleen. The spleen is an intraperitoneal lymphatic organ. It shares the same cavity and membrane as the abdominal organs. It is located in the left hypochondriac region, posterior to the stomach and inferior to the diaphragm. The spleen cannot normally be palpated. Its British vital statistics are easy to remember. The dimensions of a normal spleen are approximately 1 inch by 3 inches by 5 inches, and it weighs approximately 7 ounces. It is located between the 9th and 11th ribs. The spleen is enveloped in a fibroelastic capsule, which can expand as necessary. Inside the capsule, there is a network of blood vessels and lymphoid tissue. In section, the spleen's parenchyma will appear as areas of red tissue and white tissue called pulp. Red pulp is made up of blood-filled cavities or venous sinuses. White pulp is lymphatic tissue mainly made up of white blood cells. The spleen has two main activities. It recycles old damaged red blood cells, or erythrocytes. In the spleen, these red blood cells are broken down by macrophages into hemes and globins, 
which are subsequently further broken down into iron, bilirubin and amino acids, allowing red blood cells to be reconstituted. The spleen stores and proliferates white blood cells, or lymphocytes. White pulp consists of follicles which are rich in B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. These are the most important components of our immune system. The phagocytic system housed in the spleen is vital for the body's defense against all microorganisms. A common spleen pathology is spleen enlargement or splenomegaly. This can be caused by mononucleosis, blood disorders or lymphomas. The spleen stores a significant amount of blood. It is also the organ most injured in blunt trauma, often caused by a rib fracture in a car accident. Spleen rupture can result in considerable internal bleeding. In extreme cases, the spleen is removed. The body tolerates spleen removal, but this results in a weakened immune system. As a final note, it should be stated that the current knowledge of spleen physiology does not coincide with the functionality proposed by traditional Chinese medicine. I will comment further on this in a future video. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you'll join me for future videos in this series.